I uh, grew up in a Muslim house, uh, family very much uh, obedient to, to the Muslim faith. Uh, when I was five, went to school, at the same time went to the mosque, and I've been taught all about Islam. When I think about Allah, God, I, don't, I did not see him as this wonderful God, the creator, the, the loving caring of all people and, and all creation. I saw him as this big, giant guy that's ready to crush me. I couldn't see myself going to heaven. Not, not according to the Quran and all that teaching. I couldn't weigh my good deed against my bad deeds and see, still see myself winning, outweighing the bad deeds. There was no way I asked myself those questions. Where, where did my spiritual life go? Where is God now? What does he look at me and sees? What does he see when he sees me? What must he be thinking of me? Am I totally cut off from him because of all the sins that I committed? Is there a way back? How can I get back? One day I was offered a place to live with these Christian people. And I took the opportunity. The Christian family I moved in with had love for me. At first sight, I thought they were just uh, pretending. They were really good actors. And sooner or later, you, I'm going to find out. The truth is going to come out. Uh, then I found out the love that, that is shared between them as a family was extended to me. And it wasn't merely a natural love, as we call it, eros or filios, but it was a love that they proclaim it was from God. And I couldn't believe that, how can God give them something that He didn't give me? What do they have so precious that I don't? I saw in their lives the commitment that I didn't have. I saw how the father of their family wake up early morning, goes to work until at night. When he comes back, they reunite, they unite around the table and they hold hands and they pray or ask the children to sing a song to bless the food. I saw how he never raised his voice upon his wife or children. I saw how they spoke and the place of the woman, how she is honored. She had a voice to speak. She had really wonderful things to teach those children. And when she spoke, she, she made sense. She was intelligent, educated. I, I was faced with a man that would sit with his children and read them Bible and ask them questions at the end. And then they held hands and, and they prayed. I was astonished by this discovery to me, to my spiritual life. It was a, a, a light that shed on me. So I asked questions. And as I hear these Christian people saying to me, you need a savior. They say, we have the remedy for your disease, for your sickness. And that's when I start asking questions. So I went back to the Quran. One day I was given uh, uh, two, three, four volumes of a man, his name is Sayyid Qutb. Sayyid Qutb, he is the man that translated the Quran. As I read, I found that every reference he had to, almost every reference, was leading to the Bible. He referred to John, the, the apostle. He referred to Paul. He referred to... And that's when my questions start raising again. I say, why? We Muslims believe that the, the Bible is corrupted and we don't take it in account as of uh, true statements in it. Why is this man referring to it to enhance his explanation of the Quran? That also shed a light in my mind. I'm saying, this man is a glorious man in the Muslim world. Everybody respects him. And he is referring to the Bible 
as uh, a point of referral. That means it's really deep down uh, true. The next thing, one day I went out to the woods where I lived at 11 at night. As I got down on my knees, I looked up. I looked up to the sky and I say, God, if you're truly up there, I don't need to go as you came to Moses and spoke to him and to Jesus and to every one of the prophets. I want you to speak to me directly. I want you to show yourself to me. And this is my genuine question. Lo and behold, 30 days went by. The day I was moving out of that, that Christian home, I had mentioned to them on a Saturday, I am going to get my check on Monday out of the company I worked for, and I'm moving back where I came from. I don't think I'm going to follow you guys. I don't think I'm going to be Christian. It's not me. I'm Muslim. I'm Arab. I will die Muslim and die an Arab, and that's all I care for. I left it that way. Nevertheless, Monday came. This lady that shared her heart in the gospel with me, she had the habits of throwing tapes in my car radio. I drove that Monday at 2 o'clock. And as I am driving, a tape started. And usually I take those tapes and throw them in the back seat. And sometimes I listen to them. But I've never had the man speaking in that tape. I felt him directly speaking to me that time. And all he mentioned, he said, you want the love of God, don't you? And I just start weeping. I say, yes, I want that. That love of God. I need that love of God. If I know I, I can give my life for that love of God, if I know that this God that I believe in will love me regardless of how many sins I committed and He will wash all of them away and take them, I, I'm glad to, to be His servant. I went back to my Christian home that evening. I did not tell them anything, but they saw me as I came in and they've never seen me cry with tears. That day, they understood something I did not understand. They hugged me and cried with me from 10.30 till 2 in the morning. So Sunday came and I went to the church. I never forget that time. I went to the church and I stand up. The pastor looked at the congregation and he said, we have a brother here who wants to share something with you folks. I got up. I didn't share with you, with them as I shared with you. I had no clue what was going on. All I said, now I believe in your Jesus. He's a truly Savior. He gave me peace. He took my sins away and I believe it in, deep down in my heart. And I just wept. I look up, and the whole congregation was weeping at me. And one day, the, the, the sister that led me to the Lord with her husband, uh, her brother died, and I went to their funeral. And after the funeral, they had a, a gathering where to feed the, 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 the people, the strangers, the people that are coming from far. And, uh, I, I walked to the, to the reception afterwards and people started lighting up and coming to me and they shake my hand and they said, you must be TJ. I say yes. They give me a hug and they whisper, I've been praying for you. And after five and ten people, 20 people saying that to me. I knew that God did not save me because of me, but because of the prayers of those people. Now, six months later, 
I was in Bible University. Two years later, I was uh, serving the Lord, and I'm still serving the Lord. I went to the mosque where I used to pray. You know, and I looked at the Muslims, and I saw what they're struggling with, merely doing what they're supposed to do, what they're taught to do, duty after duty. Nothing comes from the heart. There is nothing to change that heart. You can't give love when you don't have it. You can't have peace and give it and share it when you don't know what peace means. And yet you say, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all the time. And yet there is no peace in your heart to give. If the Muslim world will open their mind to just read without any, without any judgment, they will, I promise you, uh, millions of Muslims will believe in Jesus. I believe I am Muslim, meaning I, I am submissive. Islam means submission. And being Muslim means submissive. Yes, I am Muslim, but to the Lord Jesus. To Allah through Jesus. That's who I am. I learned the peace of Islam, that Islam calls peace. Peace upon you until you disagree with me. Peace upon you until you disobey me. Peace upon you until something goes wrong or you do something wrong or you sin. Then there is no peace. If I choose not to follow this religion, Islam, Therefore, I'm an apostate, and there's no peace upon me. True peace of Jesus does not come that way. True peace is not sold or, or bought. The Lord Jesus gave it freely on the cross. And he said, my peace I give to you. And no other peace, nobody can stand beside that. Or nobody can take that away from you. I raised up uh, in, a, in a Bedouin set up uh, from in my country and uh, when I was a little child I went to a, a school it's called Khalwa and Khalwa is when you memorized the Quran and uh, at, when I was six years old I memorized the, their two parts in, in the Quran it's called Juzu Amma or Juzu Tabarak so I finished Juz Amma or Juz Tabarak. Um, my upbringing, I just prayed uh, five prayer, and uh, I did fast Ramadan, and uh, I did all uh, like zikr, just to praise Muhammad or to praise Allah and all the things. And uh, I remember I one day I, I I said to my people, I want to be an imam. And, uh, and in fact, I start to get the kids in the school uh, at noon and we break for, uh, for Salat al-Duhr and I get them and I will lead them in prayer. Allah was everything to me and uh, I wanted to please Him as much as I can. The first time I heard about Christian, when we moved from the desert, to the city and they kind of uh, give us an awareness they're going to be a Christian and I thought Christian are finished they're not existed anymore and uh, the first things I heard about Christian they're the going to be the wood of the fire in hell so they're going to burn me if I'm not good uh, a friend of mine at the university he started to tell me about Christ and I keep re rejected him and even scream at him and one time I beat him up and and I told him your Christ is not like our Christ you call him Allah and he is not Allah is Allah later on after I graduated from the university and I went and I worked as I worked as an accountant um, my friend came to visit me the one at the university 
And uh, at that time, I broke all my religious habit. I became like a city boy. And he saw the change. And he said, what happened to you? Actually, in this area, the, the, the reason I broke is not only the city, but I commit a sin against Islam. Did the Sharia. And, uh, and I, I was punished for it. And I was angry of that punishment. And this is what encouraged me to, to get away from a religious lifestyle. And I was looking for forgiveness. And I told him what happened to me, and I'm looking for forgiveness. And, and he started to tell me about Jesus forgiving sin. I loved it. And I told him, can you come back again and tell me more about Jesus forgiving sin? And, and he did. And one day, actually, he invited me to the church. And I went, and I was so scared to go to the church because I heard there's a lot of things in the church I don't want to go to. Uh, Christian, they do weird things. And, uh, but I did go to the church and uh, I was sitting in the back of the church. I said, if this Christian starts to do any weird things, I'm out of there. In the church, what opened my mind, uh, it was a prayer meeting. And different people, they start to pray about people doing bad things to them because they're Christian, talking about persecution. And I start to ask myself, why they're acting this? Because at the end of every prayer request, they ask that they may love them. And I went to the one who's leading the, that meeting, and I told him, why are you behaving like this? There is nothing called love. Love is only in the movies. And he said, no, there is a real love. And he opened the, the, the Bible. And it was in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, love your enemy and pray for those who persecuted you. And I never heard this teaching before. And I said, who said this? He said, Jesus. I told him, can I take this book, please? And he took the book and he marked for me where he read. At night in our country, um, power will go in the midnight because it's a poor country. I lit a gasoline light and I start to read where he marked. By the time when the prayer, of, uh, the, the prayer call, Al Adhan, for the morning as Subah, I was interrupted because I spent all night just reading the Bible. I never read something like this before. But I didn't take it for myself. I start to ask how Christian practice this book. This book is very hard to practice. It's easy to kill and hate, but it's difficult to love and to live holy life. And I start to go from a Christian to Christian. How do you practice this book? How do you practice book, this book? Until I met a pastor and he told me this, unless you accept Jesus in your heart, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, you cannot practice what is written here and not any, Muslim, any other Christians. And he was very convincing. I said, no, I better get away from him. And then later on, I met an elderly lady who was a Muslim, became a Christian, from the same tribe I came from. And I heard something wrong about her, the way she left the tribe. And uh, she corrected the story. And she told me that the, she was kicked out of the tribe because she became a Christian. And very slowly, she lifted a blanket from her leg. And all what I can see is the burning flesh sticking to her bones. And I told her what it is. She said, this when I became a Christian. They burned me alive, but I was rescued. And I told her, are you ready to rescue your life for Jesus? To be burned for him, she said yes, because he died for me first. And here was a turning point in my life. I went to my friend and I told him I'm ready to be a Christian. He didn't believe me. I said, yes, I'm ready to be a Christian. And he started to jump up and down and say, praise God and hallelujah, I didn't know what he's doing. And then later on, um, he asked me to kneel and I knelt and he said, repeat after me. 
if you trust me, but do it from your heart. And I started to repeat after him. He asked me to ask Jesus to forgive me. And I did ask Jesus to forgive me. And then he asked me to ask Jesus to come to my heart. And I did ask Jesus to come to my heart. And then he asked me to ask Jesus to show me the way. And I did ask Jesus to show me the way. I thought that after that prayer, something dramatically had to happen. I changed from Muslim to be a Christian. This is something big. So there should be an earthquake or there should be a thunder or something like that, but nothing happened. But there is one thing. I have a great peace in my heart. And I have this peace until now. I used to be an, uh, an angry man. And uh, I became a, a very peaceful man. And even sometimes when people, you know, like irritated me or say, make me angry, I said, you better, you're lucky. You didn't see me when I was Muslim. I will beat you up right away. But God has changed my, my life. Jesus just did a miracle in my life and changed my life totally. When I used to work, um, I used to hit one of the, the people who work with me because his work is always wrong. And I shouted at him and I swore at him many times. And when I became a Christian, I told him one day, can you come just bring a chair and sit beside me? Let me explain to you. And he looked at me and said, what's wrong here? I said, nothing. And he started to ask me more and more, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I told him, can I tell you a secret? And he was a Muslim. He said, what secret? I told him I became a Christian, and this is what happened to me. He didn't care about being a Muslim, became a Christian, but he looked more if, can Christianity change a person like this? Totally? Like from a day, like from a night to a day, you know, like it's a total change. You're explaining everything to me. You're not swearing, you're not shouting. You're not even going to get out of uh, some uh, portion out of my salary. I said, no, because Christ changed me. Maybe you're looking at me here and said, he's just a murtad. He, he just left the religion. But I'm not. I have found Christ. I have found the living God. The Bible, when I read the Bible, I haven't seen a teaching like this. All what I have seen in the, in the Quran is killing and hating. But what I have found and read in the Bible is love, the love of God. What I have found in the Bible, the true holiness of God, that God is holy and we need to come to that holiness so that we can able to know Him. I didn't know that and I didn't found it in the Quran. How many times you curse somebody for doing something wrong to you? How many times that you want to kill your enemy and you think that's your right? But Christ came and changed all this. And in a few words, he, he asked us to love our enemy. I want you to ask yourself, Today you, you memorize the Quran, you pray five times a day, you fast Ramadan, you do your zakat, maybe you can go to Hajj. But after that, what is your eternity? Nobody knows. Even Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, he said, when I worried, he, 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 even he wasn't sure that if it's going or not. But in Christianity, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There is assurance there. If it was the right religion, he will give you the assurance. But there wasn't any assurance. But Christ has given us the assurance because he know that he is the right one. Today, when you sleep at night, Maybe you said Ayat al-Kursi or, or any Ayah. But you didn't get any rest. Many times I said Ayat al-Kursi. 
and I didn't have really peace. But the minute that I accepted Christ in my heart, I have that peace. And you can experience it too. I ask you today, if you will open your heart and your mind, this is your life, this is your eternity. And just give your life totally to Him. Can you do that? And you're going to see who's going to change your life. started going to kindergarten in Jericho and I remember our first uh, chantation or song that we used to sing as kids. It was called Al-Arab Ahbabna wal Yahud Klabna which means Arabs are beloved and Jews are dogs. Didn't know what a Jew was but was raised in a very anti-Semitic culture being Palestinian. So that was the prevalent thinking process of the Palestinian. So you can imagine going to school walking outside my home, maybe seeing graffiti on the walls all over the streets. In fact, you won't find a square, you cannot find a square meter that doesn't have graffiti on all the walls of the Palestinian areas. And what kind of graffiti are we talking about? Statements like, we knock on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews. That to enter paradise, we must fight, we must fight a jihad process. Going to school, my teachers, graduates from Al-Azhar University will teach us Islamic eschatology, the studies of the ends of times, that the Jews will be destroyed to the point that the trees and the stones will cry out. There's a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim, come, O slave of Allah, come and kill him. This is a saying by the Prophet Muhammad. I even memorize it in Arabic. لا تقوم الساعة حتى تغلب طائفة من المسلمين طائفة من اليهود قيل أين يا رسول الله قال في بيت المقدس وأكنا في بيت المقدس in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations that the trees will cry out and they will destroy the Jews. Yet I never asked myself as a Muslim, what's the reason for this animosity? I believed what I was told. I believed the rhetoric and the propaganda. The Jews stole Palestinian lands, Jews persecute Palestinians, Jews are prophet killers, Jews spread that cow disease, Jews put infertility drugs for Arabs so they don't have children, Jews, uh, uh, the international Zionist movement runs the world, the Jews run the Congress and the media in America. The West is taken over by Jews, Jews influence the West. So all this ideology that I had as a Muslim. I was married to a, a Mexican-American Catholic, basically. I wanted to convert her to Islam. And she said, why should I leave my heritage? I said, well, the Jews corrupted the Bible. Because in Muslim belief today, the Christians corrupted the New Testament and the Jews corrupted the Old Testament. She said, where are the corruptions? If you show me the corruptions, I'll become Muslim. So I purchased the Bible for $10 and I started to study it. And I was fascinated with what I discovered. I discovered that the very enemy that I have, Israel, has been predicted to come back to that land. I began to understand, to ask the question, why does my teaching in Islam hate the Jewish people so much? and the teaching in the Bible loves the Jewish people so much. I began to understand what is the connection of the Jewish people in that land? What is the connection of Christ towards Israel and the Jewish people? I was fascinated to find out in uh, Isaiah that he will come to fight for Jerusalem and for the Holy Hill itself. That in Joel chapter 3 I began to read that God will gather all the nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat and there, he says, I will enter into judgment with them on the account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the people, the Gentiles. They have also divided up my land. That God will judge the world for dividing the land of Israel. I was looking at evidence. I began to look at evidence. I was interested in evidence. And in the book of Hebrews, it says, 
Faith is the thing hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. That God gave us a certain amount of evidence to believe either the Bible or the Quran is true. I began to examine the evidences between the two. I believe the Quran was true because of the classical Arabic language, of certain uh, things written in the Quran that has scientific evidence. There was science in the Quran. I began to document the science in the Quran that I learned uh, as I was in high school and growing up in the Middle East. And then I began to examine scientific evidence in the Bible. The Bible had much more scientific evidence. And all the so-called scientific evidence in the Quran were taken from the Bible. I began to look at the prophetic evidence, amazing part of the prophetic evidence. I counted 8,352 verses in prophetic evidence. No other book in history has so much prophetic evidence. I began to weigh these facts. I began to feel that there was a sound knocking on my heart. I began to understand when Christians tried to witness to me, I began to understand what they meant. I stand at the door and knock. Because I prayed to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to show me the truth. I was afraid to make the commitment. Because to become a Christian in Islam is hell. The Quran has many verses of terrorism in it, you know. Your skin will melt and new skin will come up and you just everlasting torment. But I knew that my investment in the Bible is immense because there is no way that all this evidence in the Bible can be just for no reason at all. God provided us with evidence. I wanted to invite Christ into my life, but I was afraid. And I, of course, wanted to convert my wife to Islam. It will hurt my manly image to convert to Christianity. But it was an investment, and I was offered that investment. I was offered a deal. Let me in, and I'll change your life. And I did. All what I remember is I said, come in, Lord Jesus. And that was it. The light bulb went on. I woke up my wife that night, I remember, and I asked her, I said, you know, honey, I know I was supposed to convert you to Islam. I was wrong. So I became a Christian. She couldn't believe it. We ended up getting baptized together. I began to understand my mission. And that was to follow Christ. I did not understand why I had that joy. I did not comprehend why I had this long suffering. I do not comprehend why I feel that I have to do the Lord's work from a terrorist who wanted to plant a, plant a bomb in the bank and <coughs> blew up this bank and wanted to kill a Jew all my life, wanted to take over and destroy Israel. And all of a sudden I became an ambassador, from a terrorist to an ambassador. I began to understand when Christ said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that's the only way to obtain salvation. If he is the only way, the truth and the life, without him there is no salvation. Without salvation, there is eternity in hell, and hell does exist. I urge any Muslim to read Psalm chapter 83. It talks about the Muslims coming to destroy Israel from becoming a nation. It says in the text, Come, they have said, let us destroy it from becoming a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. It talks about the confederacy of Muslim nations coming against Israel. It talks, it talks about them losing the battle. Pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with thy storm. Let them know that you, whose name alone is the Lord. Well, wait a minute. The Muslims and the Arabs lost the war so they can know who the name of the Lord is? I thought the name of the Lord was Allah. But what is in a name after all? I began to ask myself, what does it mean by the name, knowing the name? Well, his name is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. This is about Jesus, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. No one can deny that that prophecy was fulfilled because no one else in the world is called these names but one man. You can deny that Jesus was God, but you cannot deny that He was not called God. 
You cannot deny that he was not called by a whole millions of Christians, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. That prophecy was fulfilled regardless what you believe. Why? What is the secret? Why would God come down and visit mankind and die on a cross such a humiliating death? Back to the garden. Everything went back to the garden when Adam sinned and somebody had to pay for the sin. But that's the element that's rejected in Islam. If Islam rejects that Jesus paid for their sins, then they also must reject a martyr dying on the behalf of Muslims. They must reject a black stone taking away sins of Muslims when they go to the pilgrimage in Mecca. And if they take those away, what's left? There is no assurance to go to heaven. And that's the problem. That is the problem. Jesus was the bridge. He was the bridge builder. He was the one that solved the problem. God did not let his word to be changed or corrupted. For if God allows his word to be corrupted, then he's not God. God protected his word. Ten commandments are ten commandments. Jesus is who he is, claimed from the Old Testament as well. There is no claims for Islam in the Quran. The only claims is the punishments that the Muslim world will get in the ends of times. As written in the books of Ezekiel 28, 29, 30, 31, Isaiah chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Read them. Lebanon will be destroyed by the mighty one. That is very clear in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 19, the Lord will come on a swift cloud to fight Egypt. Isaiah 19, Muslim country. The Lord will come down, it says. He will come down personally. Habakkuk chapter 3, he will fight Midian, an Arab country. Isaiah 63, he will come out of Edom, the Arab Muslim world, with his garments sprinkled with blood. When Jesus comes to fight, he will come to fight the Muslims. Jesus is not a Muslim. Jesus is a Jew. The message of Christ has been predicted thousands of years ago. And all of a sudden when Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, produced a message that is contrary to that message. And the Bible warned us that there will be many false Christs amongst you. But God will bring out a remnant from these people. God will bring a remnant, come out of her my people. And he will bring those remnant. And the remnant that will come out of Islam, he promises, we will be with him forever. We will reign with him from Jerusalem, not from Mecca. Jerusalem is the holy place. Mecca was never a holy place in the Bible. Abraham never built the Kaaba. Abraham lived in Israel. If you want to know what David Daoud said, then read his book, the Psalms. If you want to know what Zechariah said, read his book in the book of Zechariah. And in chapters 12 and 14 of the book of Zechariah, it warns the Muslims, I will make Jerusalem a trembling cup to all surrounding nations. The houses will be rifled and the women ravished. In other words, yes, the Muslims will partially take over Jerusalem. And the Bible says, and the feeble amongst Judah will fight like King David. They will fight these enemies and God will be victorious and Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives. It's very clear. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. God will fight. And when His feet stands on the Mount of Olives, there will be an earthquake. He will come to fight these armies that comes against Jerusalem. In other words, the source behind the Quran and the source behind the message of Muhammad was very satanic. It's not from God. Satan always tries to appear, makes himself to be God. You must examine the evidence. You must ask yourself, is killing people from God or is it from the devil? The devil hates humanity. God loves humanity. God wants to preserve our lives. And Jesus said, whoever seeks to lose his life will save it. And whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Losing our lives as Christians is not by blowing ourselves up. Losing our lives as Christians is as Jesus told us, I will send you a sheep amongst wolves. 
In other words, we are but sheep for the slaughter. We are a persecuted people. You want to find the truth? Go find where there is persecution. You will find the Christians being persecuted by who? By the Muslims. If Islam is the truth, then why does Islam persecute us? If we are the persecutor, then we are a lie. But we're being killed day and night. That's what the Bible even predicts. Crying out every day. And the martyrs in heaven will cry out too. For how long, O Lord? These martyrs, the Bible says, they were beheaded in the name of Jesus. There's no other people that want to behead people except in the Muslim world. Wake up, my Muslim friend. God will save one-sixth of these armies that comes against Jerusalem. Be part of those people that God will save and restore. Try it. You will be filled with joy, long-suffering, everlasting life. And if you die, you simply transfer to true martyrdom, to be with Christ forever. I pray for my family all the time. Most people think that when you become a Christian and you from a Muslim background that you hate your family. In fact, it's the opposite. The family hates us. This is why every Muslim should ask, why are we hated by our own family? Yet we still love our family. Because the Bible says, love your enemies. Do good to those who do evil to you. So we love our family. And we pray for them continuously that they read the Bible. The Quran is not the truth, the Bible is. You, you cannot find the truth unless you go to the Bible and read what the Bible says. So I always pray for my family to read the Bible. <clears throat> I always pray that they pray in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The God, the only one God, the true God, to pray in His name to seek the truth and Jesus said and this is what I pray for them all the time that they seek with all their soul their heart their mind their might if you seek God with all your might with everything you got trust me you will find them as a matter of fact he will find you the Bible is the road map God has one road map and the devil has another road map the devil's road map is the wide gate in which he invents cults, religions, isms, and God has a narrow gate in which he tells us to detail what's going to happen in the future. I mean, it's amazing. How much evidence do we need to establish a case? I think the prophetic evidence in the Bible is overwhelming. I can spend a lifetime just talking about the prophetic evidence in the Bible. Yet, when I look at the Qur'an, I don't find hardly anything. What, that the Persians and the Romans will have a war? And Rome lost, and in the end they will win? That's no major prophecy. This is one of the prophecies in the Qur'an. That's like a soccer team playing a match. One of them is going to be the winner. What other prophecies is there in the Qur'an? Well, the Hadith has several prophecies in the Hadith. But those prophecies are the antithesis of what's in the Bible. These prophecies have been taken from the Bible, convoluted, in order to destroy the Muslim. Loving the Muslim is to tell them the truth. Loving the Muslim is to tell them their destiny. If I'm going to go to hell and you had the truth, and you didn't tell me that truth and I ended up going to hell for the rest of eternity I'm going to be cursing you for the rest of eternity for not telling me the truth telling the Muslim the truth is something that is an obligation for us as Christians we don't hate the Muslims to love the Muslims is to bring them out from eternal damnation this is why the Muslims think that our message is a hate message and it's not, it's a love message. We don't hate the Muslims. If I'm going to fall into a pit, I want you to stop me because if I fall into a pit and die, 
what use are you as a friend? I am your friend because I love you, because I want you to receive eternal salvation with Christ. You know, Muslims might ask the question, you know, can you be right and 1.3 billion Muslims wrong? That's the question Muslims ask me. Wait a minute, you're telling us you're right and 1.3 billion Muslims are wrong. If you believe the story of Abraham, Noah, Jesus, Moses, pick any one of them. It usually is the case. One person is right and the whole world is wrong. Noah was right and the whole world drowned. Moses was right. Abraham was right. Jesus was right. The patriarchs of the Bible were right. Zechariah was right. One man is right and usually the majority are wrong. The truth is not held in democratic elections. Democracy and truth are two contrary things. Truth is truth. One man can be right and the whole world can be wrong. The converts from Islam are right and the majority of the Muslims are entering into the wide gate. They need to switch to the narrow gate. I know many of you won't believe it because you probably part of the wide gate. But if you choose the narrow gate, that's salvation. I was born in a family where Islam was uh, a beautiful thing. And uh, I was taught in a true light of Islam. To me, Allah was like my master. And uh, I am a subject. And I would do things to please Allah all the time. And that made me happy. And I know it's hard for girl of like 12 years of age to fast you know? and I would do that without any complaints and I would be the happiest person doing that so Allah was my focus you know like my master it's, it's a supreme power you know I was told that we don't need any mediators we just have to ask Allah and he listens to us so I had full faith in it. I was confident that my prayers are heard and there is somebody who is called Allah above and He answers them. I couldn't compare any other religion to Islam. It was so good to me. So I had no way of getting into anything else. But I think God has His own plans. When I got married, my husband was from a Christian background. His mom was a Christian. and. Uh, I was very depressed to know that a person who is a Muslim has been converted to Christianity and that was a great burden on my heart. That gave me a, like a goal that I should do something, I should get into this family and bring them back to Islam. My mother-in-law, she passed away after her death. pastor came from where my mother-in-law used to worship. And they came to visit us. Then they were so sweet. And then, you know, I said, okay, I had questions now. I wanted to ask about Bible, why it's like this and things like that. I wanted to know their views. So they said, okay, then why don't we start a Bible study so that you can have all your questions and we can answer all your questions. I said, that's fine, you know, it's fair enough. And I thought I was very intelligent. Because the background I had, I thought I'm a very intelligent person and Christians know nothing, you know. They are confused people, I thought. But I went and when it went on for a year, the Bible study, and after that, you know, after that they said, now what do you say, Samson? I said, oh, now before I came to you guys thinking there is some hope, you know, but after knowing your religion, I have no, no interest. So... He said, okay, we'll be praying for you. Then that made me more angry than anything else. I said, why do these guys say that we are praying for you? Am I such a big sinner that everybody is praying for me? So when I, I came back home, I complained to my husband. And then I said, okay, I'm not going to go for Bible study, but I would like to do a comparative study of Islam and Quran. I mean, Bible and Quran. So he said, okay, it's okay if you want to do it. So we started doing 
sincerely we would compare the both the books and start jotting down few points naturally all good points came from quran and nothing came out of bible but one night like after 10 days we were doing it and one night i sat did the comparative study and i told my husband i said uh, there is one good thing that i have found the bible talks about love love of god love of god where else we don't find it in quran of course it directs you towards the love but like it doesn't say directly god is love god is forgiving god is like you know you do anything but in the name of jesus your sins are forgiven it doesn't say that in even if you are a good pious muslim you are for namaz you do everything and you die still you don't have that assurance that you have salvation your sins are forgiven and you are going to heaven there is no such thing promised to a muslim i said this one good thing is that god is love so i jotted that point down and then that that night i said you know now i, I always uh, appreciate it when christians pray you know this prayer spontaneously and we muslims don't do that we pray in our hearts quietly especially women so i said okay let me pray tonight the way christians do so i knelt down i wanted to do the way they do it i knelt down and i started praying and that night as i was trying to pray i felt as if there was a lock on my mouth and it has been unlocked and i was ref referring to all those bible verses which i had never thought that i would remember and like I, the words were flowing from my mouth you know like more than 50 60 bible verses i was reciting i think i knelt down at 9:30 in the night and by the time i finished it was 3 o'clock in the morning so my i was not tired uh, my knees didn't hurt and i i was like fresh and that night i said jesus if you are true reveal yourself to me always i said allah if jesus is true show it to me i want from you directly i don't want to take it from christians so that was the night like you know i was not on guard i i god was watching me he said it's enough samson you have been trying too hard to protect yourself now let go so i just said jesus you are true reveal yourself to me and the moment i said that like my tongue was unlocked and i was free in spirit and when i got up after the prayer for after so many hours i got up and i was still fresh and i i felt a joy in my heart and i i just wanted to tell the whole world that i am a christian and i am happy and i wanted to call the pastor i wanted to call the, those missionaries that i have been friendly with and my husband said you are mad you are crazy you, you can't call them at this hour of the night do it in the morning anyway i i was happy you know the joy was bubbling out it was oozing out of my system and my god up in the morning my husband left the house like 5 o'clock in the morning and i was not going to be like you know sleep or anything i went and took the bible and when i read and read and read and i suddenly felt that the whole room was lit up with a glow a light that was not a light that we can describe in words and it was amazing i was like taking a shower bath in that glow and i don't know how long i stayed and to my surprise my children were very small that time none of them came near to me none of them asked for a glass of water telephone didn't ring not even the postman rang the bell not the milkman came to our door it was like i was totally cut off from the world and i was having a fellowship with my lord and uh, that's how i experienced the power of and the love of jesus christ it completely changed my life like i was a staunch muslim a day before and next morning i was a strong believer in my lord that was an amazing till today i don't understand you know how can the love of god change people overnight you know, nobody can escape that love you know it's so powerful it's so awesome that you feel drenched in that love and i saw myself 
like when you see a small screen and suddenly you see a huge screen big screen I could see myself on a big screen I said oh my god is this me I thought I'm a good person I thought I'm a righteous person like the Bible says all your righteousness is like rags before God and it's so true I could see that you know, I could feel that that I was not good at all that goodness and this goodness is like pulls apart I was a Muslim and I understand like we are not supposed to read the gospel because we consider it as blasphemy and uh, we are not supposed to question Quran well that's okay I, I don't want to say anything but one thing I would like to say that with an open mind with an open heart just explore the gospel because even the Quran says you know if you don't understand anything go to the people of book go to the people where God's word has been revealed and Christians are the people of book according to Quran and if we shut the doors and if we don't want to do anything we don't want to I mean what is holding us from reading from knowing if God is so powerful then what is the fear that stops us from getting into it every Muslim should be able to listen and to read because if they listen they will be able to understand what is the gospel if you don't want to listen you read so many books you read so many uh, all sorts of literature secular literature I mean what's the problem in listening or reading the gospel if you don't like it it's okay forget about it but you may like something you may I mean you will yeah it's going to be a life-changing experience for them you will not be a loser that's that's what I pray you know that Muslim my Muslim brothers and sisters I love them you know and they are beautiful people if they could only open the gospel you know they will complete God's vision I grew up in a Muslim home and um, weekly we would go to class to learn about the Quran or we would learn how to read and write uh, in Arabic. I learned how to pray and through the years I mean I, I was I was a pretty good student. They would have books and teach us about Muhammad, his life, um, and what the Quran really means and what what he who Muhammad was and who what he actually meant uh, in Islam and um, it, it got to the point where I learned how to recite the first 11 surahs of the Quran I was praying I was fasting since I was seven years old I began fasting I was your model Muslim girl I was a good little Muslim girl So as I grew older, I started wondering. I would read the Quran. When I became a teenager, I started reading the Quran on my own and still didn't really get it. And, cause, and, and then you ask, there's no one to ask. I'm a female. I'm not allowed to ask the Shaykh. He's a man, <laughs> but he's the authority. But he's a man. So it, it's, it's a vicious cycle there. So as I picked up the Quran and started learning on my own, just reading, um, it just seemed so confusing to me. I didn't understand why how we were living was not the way the Quran was actually said. The Quran said one thing, how we were living is another thing. How other people interpreted it to me was even a third thing. Um, I was always afraid afraid to do this afraid to do that afraid it was it's, it's like kind of like having OCD I just you're afraid to do this with your right hand you're afraid to do that with your left hand because it might mean something here it might mean something there it, it was just like madness when I was 16 I had run away from home I could not take 
the um, being caged like an animal, um, not allowed to think on my own, not allowed to do anything on my own, not to, to be my own human person, um, to make my own decisions and live with the decisions that I make. Um, I left home, but a friend of mine wanted to make sure that I was safe while I was away. She put me with a Pentecostal family. This family, they, they loved God. And I was amazed at how they smiled all day long. How, what was it, why would they smile from the time they woke up to the time they laid their head down? Smiles. Um, they talked about love all the time. They talked about how Jesus loves me, and I love. I didn't. There's no love, you know. Loves me. Jesus loves me. No one ever loved me. I mean, I'm a female. I never saw where love existed in the Quran. Um, so I stayed with this family for about three weeks, and I ended up ended up back home. Um, the family gathered around because now I'm back home and the only question that everyone had both male and female not did you eat were you okay did you sleep well did anyone hurt you it was are you still a virgin and of course I am at the time but I just couldn't believe I was completely outdone and just flabbergasted that no one cared anything about me as a human being, just my, my virginity. I lost all respect for the entire family um, and wanted to seek something elsewhere as far as God was concerned. I continued, still continued to read the Quran to try to gain understanding. Um, I had already made my break at home, could not tolerate any, any of it anymore. I needed to go out and, and seek who I really am. And um, I visited church with friends. They'd invite me. I'd go. But no one ever really sat down and talked to me about Jesus. I would just go and say, it's a nice place to be. Sure, I'll go to church with you. And um, but I'll just pay attention to everything except the part where Jesus is the Son of God. So everything else I'll absorb. That part I'll just close off to. One morning, I woke up and I heard a voice tell me to go to church and I looked around and I said what and I looked to see where this voice was coming from and I heard the voice again go to church I knew it was God somehow telling me to go to get out of where I was and um, I called everyone I knew that went to church and I found one person of my entire phone book was going to church and said, sure, come on, meet me at, at, at this certain street and then we will go together. So I went to this church and it was a huge church and it was, it was really nice. Everyone looked so happy to go, marching along to ready to go to church. They were happy with their families in tow. And I just thought it was awesome to see everybody just so happy going to go someplace together and worship together. I sat there and then I said, okay, I'm here, Lord. Now what? I didn't hear anything, so I was kind of like wondering what was going on because my life depended on my being in a church that day. That's how I felt. So the following week, I went to another church with a friend, and we sat there, and it wasn't what the preacher was saying. It wasn't what the choir was singing. All of a sudden just out of nowhere it's like my eyes were open and my heart was open and my spirit was open and my soul was open and I could see with new eyes and it was like it was poured unto me this that, that I believed that Jesus was the Son of God that he's Lord and the feeling that came over me was so awesome it was, it was just I, as if I had believed my entire life that very moment. I tried even to force myself not to believe. I couldn't. I couldn't. I could not unbelieve. I believed, and that's all there was to it. So I told a friend um, afterwards, I said, I believe in God. I mean, I believe in Jesus Christ. 
And they looked and said, how wonderful. And I said, this, told them about this church and how they baptize you right on the spot if you want. And I said, I'm going to wait till next week. And now here's the fear. Someone says, well, you just, you believe and you're going to wait a week. What if something happens to you and you don't get baptized? What are you going to do? I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So the whole week, now fear. Fear, fear is the, is the factor <laughs> that, has, that has followed my life. And, but the entire week, I was very careful what I ate, where I, what I, where I walked, what I did, how I slept, and until I could get to that Sunday morning when I showed up as early as possible. I sat and waited. I waited while they had Sunday school. I waited while the while the choir sang. I waited while while the um, the uh, preacher preached. All I wanted to do was get to the end where they asked if you wanted to come to the Lord and I wanted to get baptized because you know that's what Christians do, they get baptized. So this is my thinking. So I waited and waited. So I was ready, it was, had an altar call and they opened the doors of the church so that whoever wants to accept Jesus can come forward. Um, I was sitting there and I was stuck to my chair. I couldn't get up. And then I heard the, the, the pastor say, don't let the devil hold you back in your seat. He is a liar. You know, and all of a sudden I came unglued. <laughs> I, and um, I went, I, I, I walked, and I walked up to the church, and I went to where they, to, to, where, to the receiving hands of the people who, who led me to where I needed to go to the baptismal. As I went behind this wall, the, way the stairs took you up to the baptismal area, I went up maybe three steps and I heard the voice of the enemy. I heard him say, don't go up those stairs. You can't do this. You can't go up there. You can't. You have to be a Muslim. You're gonna, they're going to come and kill you. You cannot do this. You don't belong to him. You belong to me. You can't do this. And I was shaking, shaking. And all of a sudden I heard like a whoosh. And I heard a voice tell me, walk by faith, not by sight. I analyze each word, the word walk. You're walking by, by faith. What is faith? So I went up there and um, I waited to get baptized. And I didn't know that anything about baptism. All I knew is I had to do it. I'm just being obedient and I have to do it. And So anyway, they took me down and I went to, for, uh, to be baptized, full submersion. And... Um, when I know that they take you only down for a brief moment and you're up again. But when I went down in the water, I felt as if I had been asleep for so long, such a long time. And I woke up so refreshed, just refreshed like a brand new human being. And I didn't know until later because I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know that it was in the Bible. Second Corinthians, where it said, walk by faith and not by sight. I, I did not know that. And later I learned about where, where the, it says, come ye who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's the rest that I, I didn't know it, that that was, I didn't know anything about the Bible, but that's the rest that I felt. I've never had any rest like that, God's rest is, is, there's nothing like it. Earthly rest is different than godly rest. I had always felt the tugging at my heart, the call from, from way back. I just didn't know which avenue to take, so God led me himself. He called me. He called me to, unto himself. He revealed himself to me. I was obedient. I had been asking, been seeking, just for the truth. That's all I've ever wanted was the truth. And I just would ask God, I beg you, please, just show me. Just tell me what, what it is that I'm supposed to do. And he did. He called me and he led me. And then I was baptized. And then eventually I was ravenous for the Word of God. But it was, there was a point where I didn't know how to read the Bible. I would just read it like a book from the beginning. And, but it was so frustrating to me, and I would went crying to the to the pastor because I said, you know, where's Jesus? I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I really want to know him, who he is. And he he looked at me. He was shocked. He's like, oh, 
okay. He was so kind and so loving and so gentle. And he showed me, told me about the New Testament. I didn't know what a New Testament or an Old Testament was. All I know is I had a Bible in my hand and, I, and there were, the answers were there. And I understood that he was our Savior, that he came and took our sins away. He came and, uh, and took our place. Where I should have been nailed to that cross, he did it for me. He is, he was my adha, my sacrifice. He was, he sacrificed himself for me. He sacrificed himself for all of us. Each and every single human being. And that God loved each and every one of us. Good, bad, or ugly. He loves us all. There's no respecter. God does not love a man over a woman or a woman over a man, a child over an adult. He loves us all equally. And that's something I can be happy with and satisfied with and something I believe deep down in my soul, deep down in, with every fiber of my being, that God loves us all. I want to reach out to everyone and say it's okay. It's okay. I want to share this feeling of love with, with, with you. I want to share. I want you to experience. I don't want all this joy for myself. I want to spread it out there and just give it to everyone. Um, for the, if, you, if, you, if someone is an unbeliever, um, for my Muslim brothers and sisters, you don't have to hear what I have to say. Or what anyone else has to say. Ask God yourself. Sit down alone. Speak to Him. He's a big God. We serve a very big God. He doesn't need other human beings to do His handiwork for Him. He can do everything on His own. But He chooses to use us. He chooses to use to use me. And I'm willing and willing to, to, to be used to, to, to show to free someone. From, the, from from bondage, from the, from the, the from the from the chains, the same chains that I was bound with, the same the same fears that I was gripped with. I've learned to see things differently. Fear, it's an evil spirit, and God has not didn't did not give me a spirit of fear. That is a spirit that came from the past. God removed all of that. I never have to fear anything or anyone. I'm not afraid of God. I fear Him for being the awesome, mighty Creator. But I'm not afraid of Him. God said to take on His yoke because it's easy. Take on, take on our burdens that we put on our, our burdens that we put on ourselves. When I would say that I was born and raised as a Muslim, it's not because I chose it. I didn't willingly choose it. It's just, it just was. You're just born into it. You're born, and you, that's the only way, that's the only reason why I would call myself a Muslim. My mother and father are Muslim. Their mother and father were Muslim. The great great grandparents were Muslim. Not because we chose it, because that's, you're born into that family. It's just like I'm born into the name of this family, the, you know, my family name. I was born into it. But to willingly make that choice for yourself, that I willingly choose God, I willingly choose, I repent of all my sins, and I willingly give my life over to Jesus Christ. I willingly let, let God take control of my life instead of letting man take control of my life. That I willingly let myself go of all these burdens and just, take, and just be at peace with God. You feel so free, so peaceful. Your mind will be at peace. Your heart will be at peace. Your home will be at peace. There's an inner peace that you have. You could be surrounded with a ton of people, many in a crowd, and just all this commotion around you, and you could just sit back and be at peace and knowing that God is in control.